Hello everyone. Thank you for coming to this um, RTS In Conversation and for foregoing your lunch for about an hour. Um, I'm Miranda Sawyer, I'm the audio critic from The Observer and with me virtually is uh, James Purnell in his Zoom nook in his house. Should we wave James? Then it looks Hello, like everybody. we Hello, know Miranda. each other. Hi. Hi audience that we can't see. It's very nice that you're here. We're very happy to be here. Um, the way that this hour is going to go is um, I'm going to chat to James for, um, well, yes, about an hour. Um, and um, if you want to send any questions, there's a Q&A bit at the bottom of um, Zoom, which I'm sure you're all completely familiar with now, as we have been Zooming for months. Um, and, um, and that's pretty much it. So I will do my intro because it's always nice to have an intro, I feel, James, and then we will crack on. All right. So James Pennell, the other person, the one who's not talking, is the BBC's head of education and radio. He worked at the BBC in 1995 for two years as head of corporate planning before becoming a Labour MP for several years, serving in the DCMS and the Department of Work and Pensions. He rejoined the BBC in 2013 as Director of Strategy and Digital before becoming Director of Head Education and Radio in 2016. And I would give you a huge round of applause, but it seems a bit ludicrous to do that right now. <laughs> so look, I feel like we should start, as all uh, conversations start this uh, at the moment, um, with lockdown. Uh, actually, I mean, there is an argument around lockdown, particularly as you're in the charge of education, that the BBC's response to lockdown, the bite size and that kind of rapid response to the difficulties that people had with um, home educating their children, is um, it, it kind of has provided the biggest boost to the BBC's reputation in years. No, is that, is that not true? Uh, and I guess I, I always feel with this question, it's really important just to go back to the start and how awful this has been um because you can get into thinking about the positive side of it um but you know i've, I've had friends extremely ill it's been a, a, a terrible situation and it's been i mean it's been a crisis obviously and i think public service broadcasting is important in normal times but in a moment of crisis it really reminds us why we need public service media because we're a public and we need to have a collective uh, media experience, a collective set of facts, um, and we're here to serve people. So, you know, we were able to sort of move completely overnight, pretty much, into serving people's needs in the crisis. And, um, and that was true of education, uh, perhaps most of all in the whole organisation. I think the, um, uh, <laughs> there was a survey which uh, went and asked kids and um, parents who they'd seen making a difference during lockdown and uh, kids had a list mum came in fourth dad was nowhere on the list uh, but top was YouTube and, and the BBC so I think you know essentially what we've done is provided an entirely new education service and the team that did that amazingly did that obviously themselves in lockdown but were able to provide 10 hours of new TV a week uh, 150 lessons a week and it seems to have really, really uh, hit a chord of people and provided a, a great service. Very much, I mean, very much so. I mean, the, I suppose what I wanted to ask is, that is a, a rapid response. It, was a, it has been a great response, particularly if you're educating uh, children at home. I think if you're, I mean, actually, even if your children are older, they're very likely to use bite size. Um, it was a very quick response. I kind of wanted to know really how, how well set up you're obviously really well set up to do this and how did you use i mean this what was the set what was it about the bbc setup that was so good that you could respond really really quickly i mean i wondered partly if it was because everybody was at home as well i mean you know you're not always going to get jesse lingard marcus rashford or you know danny dyer yeah. at home in order to help you in that way yes i think there's a lot of truth from that um it's a great question. I think some of it was we had an education service, we had lots of resources, uh, which we could suddenly, you know, point at this new crisis. Actually, some of it was that suddenly all of the processes were kind of cut through. You know, we, we didn't have to take papers to the board, we didn't have to go and get regulatory permission, we were just able to think about what the audience uh, needed. And, you know, Tony Hall gave us a very clear intent, but, you know, where sometimes you have to kind of do a paper and kind of make the case and assemble the money and 
we just went off and did it and we found the money quickly and it was i think it was a you know actually for the bbc of the future it's a great example about how we can kind of have freedom within a framework you create a framework which is we need to educate kids at home it needs to be high quality it needs to be simple and stuff that parents can trust and now you get on with it and people you know did it in conditions which were 10 times harder than they would have you know these, these were parents quite often who were making all this content obviously their kids by and large weren't at school either so even in more difficult circumstances we were able to move faster than uh, than sometimes we can because of that very clear intent and, and also it was a moment it was a moment of crisis so that really galvanized people and and actually the commercial sector were brilliant in terms of just saying fine you can use our content uh, and we sort of cut through a whole bunch of licensing and rights issues uh, uh, as well but I, I do think there's a a more general lesson for the future in terms of how we can move quickly. That's interesting because often what's um, raised up against the BBC, it's actually in my my later questions, is always that idea that with the BBC there's a there's a problem with with uh, kind of inverted commas middle management that it takes ages to get things commissioned, it has to go through uh, loads of process and that's that's always the charge that's leveled at the BBC isn't it? There's intense scrutiny on all sorts of levels. Do you imagine that that might change or was it just a moment um that we've been, been experiencing I think, well we've been trying to get better at that over the years and i think some of that did come in because of you know some of the editorial problems of you know the, the previous decade but two um most obviously ross brand which brought in you know a whole new system but i think that the, the, there was a point at which the organization was being careful i think certainly for the last um, six or seven years we've been trying to say we want to give power to the commissioner within this framework to go away and deliver great content and you know sometimes that can be experienced as bureaucracy sometimes it can also be the benefit of a brilliant commissioner giving you great notes to get to a really high quality program sometimes it's the fact that we're regulated we have quite complicated editorial guidelines but they're very important because of the unique nature of the BBC so so I hope that's an improving picture. And I certainly think once you've seen yourself do it in a crisis, yeah, you know, you can. you know you can do it. So actually mm -hmm. you can go, well, you know, we put on, we created a new education service in four weeks. Maybe we can bring that to our, to our business as usual. Yeah. And what about you yourself? Because I know that um, you have a, a young daughter at home. What bits of bite size did you use and how are you at home education yourself? Please be honest. We've all had crises i think well, you have to give yourself permission i mean what i've said to people all the way through is don't expect yourself to be perfect at work don't expect yourself to be perfect at home so um we we used a lot of bite size uh, <laughs> uh which was it was great and you know she formed she really formed a close attachment with with the presenters she enjoyed a lot of the content um which specific presenters i want to know karim i think was a particular favorite but, okay fair um, uh, lovely karim <laughs> um, but there's great resources out there. Yes, we got brilliant resources from our school. We were getting a, a lesson planner every day. You know, there's some fantastic phonics resources um, uh, that we were using. You know, Khan Academy do some great stuff. So there's really great content uh, out there. I guess to kind of go to a wider point, I wonder if a Rubicon's been crossed now. I, I think for lots of us who grew up in a more traditional educational environment, we thought a school was something that happened in a classroom. Mm. with people talking and that's always going to be there but I think we are going to have a mix of the two and the challenge is now can we get the best of the two you know are we going to have a world where I mean, the jargon now is blended education where students are getting you know the, the uh, ability to have online lessons and then the teachers and the assistants are freed up to do what they only they can do in terms of extra help pastoral care inspiration um, teaching the curriculum in ways that can't be done through a computer. So I think there's a, and now we all know we can do it. You know, it's, obviously it's incredibly challenging and we all love and respect teachers even more than we did before, but that we can also see the role that we can play. You know, and yeah. I think that's, that's something which can, you know, I think it can be incredibly beneficial for kids who struggle, you know, kids who are in uh, youth offender institutions, kids who are excluded, kids who find things more difficult can really help with them. But actually in arts and music, we've had a dream for decades now of getting the best musicians, artists into the schools around the country. We can do that now on a basis of, of real equality as well. So I, I think there's, there's a huge opportunity to get the best of both worlds out of, out of blended learning. 
this is what we like, positive thinking, this is good. Um, what about, um, uh, there's a there's a, a recent announcement which I thought was very sweet, which is um, even taking kind of a, a form of education, not really education, but a help to people with really young kids. Because the people I did feel really so sorry for was uh, was uh, people with toddlers in lockdown. Because you know my children luckily have gone past that age. It is a tough age to be locked at home. Absolutely. And um, there's a tiny happy people is is I, I checked this out, which seems to be at least providing you with the idea that you might do something that's useful for 20 minutes and you've done a big tick you know before yeah. you go and slump in front of the telly you know all hell the parents of toddlers i absolutely agree <laughs> been, uh, particularly challenging um so that was something we've been planning for a while uh, it's a campaign which is trying to address the inequality between uh kids from um different backgrounds who there's about a third of kids who get to uh, school in poorer areas who don't have the basic literacy um to be able to start learning properly so that's that's not reading and writing that's just being able to talk and understand questions and and, and respond and the shocking thing is that that is a gap that they never catch up it affects their their, their learning it affects their life chances uh, but the optimistic thing to strike a second optimistic note is it's actually quite easy to address you don't need to be particularly literate yourself to address it it's about talking to your child us all talking to children um, uh, health professionals, other professionals who come into contact with children, young children, just knowing that by talking to them, listening, playing um, uh, rhyming games, uh, a whole range of things, we can develop kids' literacy and we can close that gap. And there's been very interesting um, uh, experiments in places like Stoke where they close that gap quite significantly by having a campaign of this nature. And so what we want to do is try and have a campaign like that across the next five or ten years to try and halve that gap between um, better off kids and poorer kids in terms of the, their literacy when they get to school because we think that will have a big effect on life chances and, and if you're I, interested the brilliant set of resources online which also double up as a good lockdown activity um, uh, uh, register. Yeah, I did check them out. I was very happy I didn't have to use them myself, I have to say. But I mean, there's part of that that strike the two things that strike me is one is the irony of teaching people to um, be able to talk to their children via the via a screen, which is quite interesting, because often what um, parents say is that their children aren't talking because they're on screens all the time. Yeah. And the other one is it's almost um, um, a governmental role. There. You know, you're saying, okay, what, one of the things that the BBC can do is increase the, in, increase the literacy, literacy chances of people that, of young children that might not be able to have it otherwise. And that's actually quite governmental, isn't it? Well, we try to stay independent of government, um, uh, it, even in this area where obviously they do, you know, we do talk to them. But, but the BBC has always been more than a broadcaster. You know, we have always been here to make a difference to, to people and to society. And, and obviously, where topics are controversial, we, you know, we wouldn't get involved in campaigns of this kind, but you know, it, our, our mission is to inform, educate and entertain. And this is absolutely the heart of, uh, of educating and trying to, to help people have those skills. So it, I, I wouldn't pretend that there's never any issues there of the balance between journalism and campaigning, but where things are widely supported and we think that they are you know, for the benefit of the country, it's something the BBC has done you know, for, for a very long time. And actually it's the purpose of journalism is also to bring about uh, a better society. Okay, right, so shall we talk radio? Given we've done a bit of education, let's move on to um, radio. So that was another kind of rapid response because on one level you might think, okay, radio's fine. You know, on one level you can just leave it. It's, it's, it's ticking over, it's okay. But there are obviously questions of studios and actually there was questions of scheduling, wasn't there? And I wanted to ask you a little bit about um, about those kind of nitty gritty elements of radio, who you chose to be able to broadcast from home, how it was chosen, who could, who had to go into the studios, how that worked. Yeah, so, I mean, it didn't feel fine at the time. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I went back and read a blog that I wrote um, a couple of months ago in the middle of it all, which I completely forgotten that I'd, that I'd written. And in the middle of it, you can see, we're actually thinking, God, can we keep our services on air? And um, we went from, having nearly everyone in the office to having 90% of people at home. Uh, and we would normally have thought, God, well, that means we can't broadcast. The only people who can broadcast are people uh, in the office. So we went through a process of streamlining the schedules. 
you know, at one point we were planning for closing down various stations, but because of the sort of flexibility and ingenuity of our staff, not least our technical staff, we suddenly found we were able to do a lot of that from home. So actually- Can I just ask a really quick question? What stations were you thinking you had to shut down? Uh, we would obviously have prioritised those which were uh, providing information and providing the biggest audience. So I'm probably not going to go into exactly which ones we'd have put, uh, we'd, have, we'd have closed down first, but we'd have, we had a plan for making sure that, you know, if, and this was planning, if a very severe lockdown had happened or if we hadn't been able to travel at all, what we would have, what we'd have done. But we did all that planning and then we didn't, we didn't need it in the end. Um, and I don't know how nitty gritty you want to get, but, but basically what happened was people found ways of using voice memos on uh, iPhone in particular. Our uh, colleagues in d &E, our IT uh, colleagues, had brilliantly sort of planned for this. And there was an app on the BBC Essentials um, uh, website, which allowed you to record at home. So that was really useful. Um, and so we did that for a little bit. And for, so, so while you'll remember, there was, you could, it was OK to hear, but the quality was a bit intermittent. Mm. And then gradually we got laptops out to, to nearly everybody. We started shipping out some codecs to people. So that's kind of pretty heavy duty kit. But again, brilliantly, uh, some of our colleagues used some Raspberry Pi computers, which are the sort of learning yeah, computers. I know those. And, yep. Yeah, turned, well, they basically turned those into um, uh, a home broadcasting system. And the, the little button on the front says sort of green button says record and it, it records and it's, you know, it's very high quality. And by and large, I think people are not hearing the kind of iPhone uh, um, uh, static which we had at the start of at the start of lockdown. And how do you feel about scheduling in the uh, as we kind of come out of lockdown? Because obviously, you know, there was a there was a shift around of, sh of schedules on you know Six Music and other stations, which were to do with people not having their usual commute. You know, essentially, that's the that's the fundamental. Um, and I mean, there is a sense slightly that, that that usual commute won't come back, given that, you know, large organisations are saying, OK, we're only going to do three days a week or whatever. That that sense of that everybody getting up at the same time, everybody going to do the things at the same time is slightly different now, isn't it? Yes, it's an incredibly good point. Um, I mean, for a long time, we saw a big gap um, from the commute not being there, particularly in the morning. And mm. that the, the kind of peak time for Radio 1 was moving to 11 o'clock. Actually, that was when you were getting the, the sort of, uh, not for some of the other stations, because other people were getting up, getting up earlier. Um, but we have now started to see that come back, the commute. And actually, if you compare the pre-COVID period to now, we are broadly stable on that. There's been some changes within that. So the commute hasn't come back completely. But what we have seen is people finding new, longer habits with some oh. stations. So people seem to be... Um, finding more that they love and leaving the radio on for longer. So we're seeing that, you know, at, at the start of this period, there was a huge um, interest in Radio 4 and 5 Live, um, big, big peak for that. Then kind of in the middle of it, we saw specialist music stations like 3, like Asian um, uh, Network, like 6 Music, one extra really, really prospering, getting people listening for, for longer. Uh, and now we're really seeing Radio 1 and Radio 2 um, at the levels they were they were at before. So overall, we're kind of broadly stable on where we were, but um, there's been some change underneath underneath the surface. And people, the listening time is up compared to before. So people seem to be spending more time more time with us. More, more time at home. That's quite good. Okay, I have to say, um, you know, I am a, a, a an audio critic, a radio critic, um, and the Archers did try to do their best with um, with the co with the COVID situation. But I would say. It hasn't been entirely successful. Um, do you feel that there's something to be learnt about perhaps more modern um, uh, drama making techniques that, that hadn't been adopted around things like the archers? Because in the end they were doing monologues that were very static and, and um, not very realistic at all. And I, I think to sort of track back to what that was like when it started, the kind of whole of drama production across TV and radio had stopped and so what they did was to bring back um, a, a regular uh, soap opera, which involves a huge amount of post-production. And therefore it, it was just technically impossible to do some kind of post-production editing to get kind of dialogue and do the kinds of things which 
you know, we would obviously all yearn and they would all yearn to have as well. And so I think within within that, actually, I've some episodes I really enjoyed. It was obviously different, um, uh, but sometimes being in the head of someone and seeing all of the different kind of misperceptions between the interior worlds of different characters, I thought was actually incredibly dramatic and rather moving sometimes. But, but I, I, I recognize that not everyone has, has felt that. You know, we are going to start bringing some dialogue back. But again, because it's a, uh, a daily show, that's not, that's not always simple to, to do, but you're going to start to see some of that. So I, I suppose I think everyone should maybe um, recognize quite how challenging bringing that back was at all and compare it to most other places where we haven't really had any contemporary drama which has talked about COVID in this period of any kind. So I, I think the team did brilliantly to, to have anything back on that. Okay, you are being nice. Uh, right, okay, I wanted to um, also ask you, I suppose, about the culture of the BBC. You know, normally, if you go to work for the BBC, you go to an environment that is a BBC environment. You go to Broadcasting House or New Broadcasting House, and you yeah. walk in, and as soon as you walk into Radio 4, you get a bit more kind of Radio 4, well, this is yeah. me, but I, my voice goes a bit posher, we go a bit more Radio 4. <laughs> um, like, there, that is obviously not happening. And there's an element where we're all being told it's great to work from foam, that's, uh, that's fantastic. But there's a, something about the culture of everybody being in the same space that is lost, isn't it? Yes. I think there's also I mean, how do you maintain that, that kind of, you know, the BBC, you know, bouncing off each other, having ideas, you know, that culture? But there are definitely things we miss and we should talk about those. Um, but actually, I think we've mostly gained. We've been much more connected. Uh, you know, Tony Hall does a, a kind of uh, a radio programme every lunchtime on Wednesdays, which has got 10, 15, 20,000 people. And we, I mean, we have tough questions on there we can talk about the important issues we can talk about what's amazing creatively that's coming up I, I do that in my team every week you know we have a, a what we call an all hands session every Thursday and again hundreds of people coming and talking and it's created a much more collective sense of us as a BBC us as radio and music us as children in education and so I, I think you know when you work in a company like the BBC you've got multiple identities you've got your program your station the BBC, your division, and I think sometimes we can, you know, the, the sort of the nature of the buildings of the BBC can mean that that sense of the collective isn't as uh, much in people's weeks, and we've really been able to put it in people's weeks, and I think that has made us a more democratic, more transparent, more collaborative organisation, so, so I, I think that's the positive side of it. As you say, creatively it is harder, you know, having a really proper brainstorming session or creative development session or you know, script editing or rehearsal, those things are harder. Difficult things are harder, you know, having a difficult um, interpersonal conversation or talking about, that's much harder. Um, we miss each other, you know, we haven't seen colleagues for months now and it, it, you just lose a sense of shared momentum, I think, and you as a corporate organizer. So, so I think what we want now to try and get the best of both worlds that kind of democratic connected collaborative identifying with the organization combined with the personal and the creative but but i, I think if you kind of think back to pictures black and white pictures of normally women at typing pools in the 1950s i think the idea of sitting next to each other doing emails on a computer i think that will feel as outdated in five years time as the picture of the the typing pools i think going back into the office to do email i think is is it's very mad Matt, yeah. How many times have you been into the office then since lockdown? Uh, I have been in twice to the office. And no, what, three, three, what times. three times? What occasioned those uh, visits? I went in twice just to see our presenters and our producers and just, you know, because um, we were, we, we obviously survey our staff, we talk to them regularly, and, but you can't really get a sense of what it was like unless you were, unless you were in there. Um, and then the other time was to go and appear on the Tony Hall uh, Wednesday, <laughs> Wednesday they connected call but um, yeah I mean it's weird it's weird it's definitely weird I had, a, I had a brilliant one moment where we're following the one-way system around the fourth floor and I found it couldn't get me into any lifts or any uh, any stairwells and I'm, I'm a very rule following person so I, I literally couldn't get out of the building until Emma Barnett told me that there was a staircase that you could go down <laughs> Good old Emma, straight to the point, out you got. Okay, I have a question.
question actually from somebody who's remained anonymous, which is, and I thought I'd bring it up now because we've been you've been talking about Tony Hall. Obviously, Tony Hall is leaving, so um, uh, and Tim Davies coming in, and the question is, how much are you looking forward to the new DG, and what changes? would you think and what should they bring what should he bring to the corporation well i've loved working with tony i mean obviously i came in with tony in his first in his first few weeks and i think he's been a brilliant dg i think he really stabilized the organization after a period of tumult uh, and you know delivered a charter which has been you know the stability of the 11 year uh, charter is something which i think people are really appreciating now um and he's also led a fantastic creative renewal um uh, and put amazing priority on you know, products like Sounds, which I've led and iPlayer, which are now growing in a way that's replacing some of the lost audience from Linear. So uh, it's been a joy working with him. Um, uh, we all work with Tim, uh, so we were really delighted to see him be appointed. And obviously, you know, the great thing about having someone from the inside is he's been part of delivering the strategy. Um, but he's obviously going to put his own stamp on it. Um, I'm not going to start getting into querying his pitch because I know he wants to. He wants to do that when he starts in September, but you know, I think the, the feeling around the um, the place is really good about looking forward to working with him. That is so diplomatic. I can't believe it. Okay. Um, well, the other part of the question was, um, do you feel like the BBC is in peril? I mean, the peril, I suppose, is uh, twofold, isn't it? One, that obviously changing audiences, different people are uh, are have other options and the other one is obviously budget those are two different major factors aren't they really should we talk about them um uh, in two different in two different ways let's talk about the idea of the bbc um not being a unique um well not being the only broadcaster in these in this kind of uh, digital world because i remember also i mean in radio you, you you kind of said a couple of years ago that um, the BBC shouldn't really concentrate on just getting small hits, you know, that you you weren't really rating radars. But what BBC Radio in particular should do is keep its existing lead listeners, but then also reach new audiences in different ways. And this seems to be what the BBC is trying to do all the time, trying to keep everybody watching uh, BBC One or whatever, you know, listening to um, Six Music or Five Live or whatever, and then also offering loads of podcasts and that seems to me an amazing idea but how do you do it with budgets i mean that's it's almost impossible there's a lot in that uh, so yeah uh, i mean to go back to the start peril no i wouldn't say peril i think there's jeopardy you know we have gone from being initially the only broadcaster then one of a handful and now obviously we're in a market which all the biggest companies in the world are are, are in and there's unlimited money you know people can come into this market say I'm going to have a go at TV and you know, my table stakes is a billion quid. So, so th there is, uh, there's clearly jeopardy around that in terms of us maintaining uh, a daily or weekly habit with our, with our audiences. Having said that, I think we've got a very clear plan to, to do that and it's working. You know, as I say, both with iPlayer and with Sounds now and with podcasts, that, that consumption is broadly making up for the loss uh, of linear consumption. And actually people sometimes say, isn't there a kind of tension between those two? And we absolutely feel the opposite, that the combination of being able to put um, a program out on Six Music, but then also have it available on demand on sounds, uh, it, it is a huge competitive advantage because you can bring people to content, you know, and it's important to talent as well. Of course, people can make their podcast famous by themselves, but actually, if you look at something like Forest 404, which was quite experimental drama, because we put the full might of the BBC behind it, we brought it to a much bigger audience and it ended up topping, topping the chart. So, so I think that combination of, of linear on demand is something that we really, really think we can, we can build on. Okay, I'm going to go to budgets then. Yeah. <laughs> That's, yeah. I mean, that is the difficulty, isn't it? I mean, I, Forest 404 was a great, it, absolutely great uh, drama, really brilliant. But there is a question of, you know, how you distribute the, the money. You're trying to do a lot of things when essentially you've also got a kind of 800 million pound uh, cuts to make, you know, plus I imagine, I mean, well, there are more cuts to be made because of uh, COVID. Yes, that's right. Um, and we are making more cuts because we've lost some of our license fee income and commercial income. And it's difficult. Actually, we're quite good at it. You know, we, we Radio Music has made all of its share of those cuts towards the 800 million. But we didn't stop there. We went further to be able to move money 
sometimes into podcasts, sometimes it's actually into bigger drama budgets on Radio 4, longer investigation. So, so you know, and inside the BBC, that can feel quite challenging sometimes. Actually, I think it is just the way of the world. We have to be able to move our money because our audiences are moving. And actually, because there are new creative opportunities, you know, for obviously when we set up Sounds, that was sometimes seen as a rival source of money. Why are you doing this new thing? One of the things that's really changed the mood around that within, within radio is that people can see the huge creative opportunities from it. You know, if you can do something like the Missing Crypto Queen, kind of live investigation into something which is stopping people from getting fleeced by a fake cryptocurrency, but is also incredibly dramatic. That would have been very hard to do just on the radio. So, so as people have seen that benefit, I think it's become you know, it's become much more, not just accepted, but people more enthusiastic about it. In terms of money, we are also now trying to make the two work together much more symbiotically. So at the start, podcasts weren't really going out on the radio as much. Now it is very unusual for a podcast not to have a space on the radio. And then the, the, the combination of the two makes the money go, makes the money go further. Okay, uh, BBC Sounds, shall we talk that really quickly? Okay, BBC Sounds, um, I was at the launch, it was quite a, a high profile launch. Um, it had uh, sticking problems, didn't it? And one of the main problems, it seems to me, is that it, at the moment, still, it is, um, a, if you want it to be a gateway to podcasts, which it should be, obviously, it's BBC Sounds, is it doesn't have all the big podcasts on there that you might want. You know, I mean, if I, if somebody asked me, what podcast would you start off with? I would say Serial, I would say, um, uh, I might say uh, uh, Shagged, Married, Annoyed or something like that. You know, th th those big gateway podcasts that people um, want to go to are not always on BBC Sounds, are they? Well, not at all. And you're right about that. So we're going to remedy that uh, this year. So we're going to be, we've got uh, regulatory permission for this. Um, we're going to be taking non-BBC podcasts onto the BBC for the first time. We think there's a, a, a huge public service benefit to that because we can you know serve British audiences and, and British content makers and make their journey to finding great content even better I mean any podcast fan knows that it's quite a high cost in terms of discovery to find the best content mm -hmm. obviously reading reviews is a key part of that but we can we can play the kind of role that we have in music for for podcasts so we are very committed to uh, to doing to doing that and that will be I think that does mean that there's then a, a reason for sounds to become your only podcast app, whereas at the moment, we hope it's the best place to get your BBC content, but obviously people often but want others. to have, you know, one main app. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was a kind of, uh, uh, what do you call it, a beta launch, wasn't it? I mean, so I imagine, were there, were there ideas that you knew it was going to get better? Did you just feel that you had to get it out quick? Well, we were behind you know we, we ideally would have done this five or six years ago and we would normally you launch into a market where there isn't a podcast app you know when the iPlayer launched or when Netflix started they were doing something new and people forgive you for a whole bunch of things that don't work and they also don't know about all the innovation that is going to happen three or four years later which they are missing at the start so we were playing catch up uh, we launched not quite a beta but you know sort of a minimum viable product um, I think actually what's remarkable is we've completely smashed all of our audience targets. You know, we were aiming for 2.2 million weekly users. We're now at three and a half. Uh, Reuters did a study the other day where they sort of uh, looked at the main podcast consuming countries and asked people which app they use to discover podcasts. In every country apart from the UK, the top one was Spotify, which is interesting. Mm. Not Apple, but Spotify. Um, it may have been Apple in America. Uh, in the UK, it was it was BBC Sounds, and obviously those are great apps. But having a British app thinking about British taste and British creativity feels like a, a big thing. And so I think we 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 definitely had a period after the launch where we had some some issues, and we had to work hard to address those on the product side, on the content side. Um, but actually, I feel that you know a year a year later, we are way way ahead of where we expected to be. And once we start to um, bring in third party podcasts and also start really delivering on the promise of making the content relevant to you. I think sounds is really going to, I genuinely think it's really going to fly. Okay. What about, shall we talk about talent? Let's talk talent. Yeah. Um, there has been um, uh, various kind of, especially in radio, really um, uh, high profile um, 
uh, moves, I would say, from uh, presenters. So we can, you know, obviously Chris Evans is one. Um, we can also say Eddie Mayer from Radio 4, but we can also now say Asma Mir, who's gone to um, uh, Times Radio, as has Stig Abel. Um, what do you think about these moves? Do they ever worry you? What do you do about them? Great question. Look, we, we try and persuade people to stay, um, but it's okay when people leave. You know, we the, the, the fact that we've gone from we basically gone from a market where in lots of those genre, we were the only show in town. Mm -hmm. We now have a, a resurgent commercial radio sector. Uh, uh, so, you know, LBC, Times Radio, dozens of new stations being launched, so Scala with Simon, Simon Mayer. Um, we've also got, obviously, Spotify, Apple, Amazon, the biggest companies in the world. So I think when I look at it, actually what's heartening is, although there have been some high profile uh, departures, vast majority of our team have stayed with us. And I think that's because we offer an opportunity to make the best content. For, for not, we don't have to be the best for everybody, for every single presenter, but for a slice of people, we have to be the best place for them to make their content. And, and genuinely, my experience is mostly people, people stay for that reason. If they go, then we wish them well, and we hope to get them back at a later stage in their career, which, which also happens often. But, but it, for me, it's a sign that we've gone from being the only provider in town quite a lot of the time to now it being a much, much bigger, more competitive, competitive market. Um, okay, given that it is a much more um, uh, bigger than a competitive market, uh, are you worried about the license fee? What do you think is going to happen? I'm a license fee fundamentalist. I, I sort of think that the world is justifying the license fee the more uh, every day that we, we go by because you know, just look at all the issues that people have with what information to trust, making content about our country, making uh, programs which people can sort of see themselves reflected in. You know, th there's hugely great choice, greater choice from um, streamers, but that has not replaced the need for public service media. And I think the license fee, probably modernised, is, is a very good way of funding that. What if you don't, I mean, if you don't get your way, though, I mean, there may well be a situation where uh, a, a government they say you might like the license fee but we don't want it anymore um well i'll see that we you know, we will make the case for um public funding of of the bbc and you know every time that that has happened before there's often been predictions this was the last time uh, that there would be a license fee and actually whenever the question has come people have been very supportive of the bbc and, and they look at the other ways of funding uh, the organization and they could deliver a successful organization, but not the one that we have now. You know, the BBC could be a subscription organization, it just wouldn't be a universal uh, um, media provider. And if you think back to where we started in this conversation in terms of COVID, if we were a subscription provider, you know, uh, which was much more expensive and, and used by 40% of the population, we wouldn't have been able to provide the role that we did in terms of public information or in terms of uh, education. So, so I, I, you know, it's, it's obviously a possible framework, I just don't think that we think it's a desirable framework. Doesn't mean yeah. that everything about the license fee as it is today will stay forever. You know, the license fee has evolved every 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 charter review, but some kind of universal funding does feel like it contributes to the success of the organization that we have today. Okay, obviously then we should move very quickly to the over 75s um, <laughs> concession where that's what's happening with that. How, do you, how did you feel about it in the first place and what do you feel about it now? In the first place, when when, when, it, when we were when the BBC was uh, told that it had to happen, we were very surprised. Um, uh, we were told that wasn't something the government weren't planning to do, and obviously, when they presented it to, to us, um, it was presented as, as something of which the BBC had no, no influence. Uh, so we then tried to work very hard to uh, uh, get to a settlement in terms of the charter review and the license fee, which would allow the BBC to be to be successful. Uh, and I think by and large, we, we did that. Uh, you know, as I say, an 11 year charter, the license fee protected, uh, our income rising broadly in line with, in, with inflation before, before COVID. So it, it wasn't what we wanted, but we were able to get to a deal which has allowed the BBC to be on a sustainable uh, basis. Although it has meant, as you said earlier, 800 million pounds worth of, of cuts. So yeah, it, it wasn't what we wanted, but you know, you have to deal with the, the government that you have and you have to reach an an agreement which ensures uh, the BBC can succeed for, 
uh, philosophy depends. Um, okay, given that you just mentioned you have to deal with the government that you had, there's a question here from Peter Wallace who says, um, why on earth haven't you mentioned Dominic Cummings' 2004 resolve to destroy the BBC? Because that is what matters. Peter used to be my boss, so I should... <laughs> <laughs> well, he's on your side. Um, I don't think that, with great respect to Peter, I don't think that is um, the most important issue. I think the most important issue is how do we deliver for our audiences. Okay, but let's. But, but I still think we can talk about it a bit, can't we? I mean, if if there is a resolve somewhere within the heart of government, you know, the um, the, the the part of government that we don't really see but seems to be operating um, uh, behind the scenes, if there is within that government an idea that the BBC is not a good thing, that is quite a difficult position for you to negotiate with, isn't it? Well, I mean, that's why the virtue of an 11 year charter is incredibly important. You know, the, the way that we have negotiated the BBC's independence in this country is that we have that debate every, every 10 years and we'll have that debate um, in 2026, 2027. Um, I have to say that my experience of the last few months is not the one that Peter would would fear. You know, we have worked closely. We have been uh, uh, on you know public health information uh, at the same time as being able to challenge journalistically. Uh, but I think the the work that has been done has been appreciated, and, and I wouldn't characterise our relationships as being like the ones that uh, Peter is alluding to. Okay, fair enough. But we'll have to persuade people. You know, the BBC has had to yeah. do that in every generation. You know, John Burt had to do that. Uh, with the Thatcher government in the in the 1980s. In the end, the reason that those um, uh, negotiations have always been successful is that the BBC has been delivering for its audiences and making the country better. That, that's the key thing to focus on. It's not, I, I, I think, trying to work out the kind of uh, what's happening in the palace corridors. It's to focus on doing a brilliant, a brilliant job. And that's why 200,000 people wrote in to the government last time supporting supporting the BBC in its continuation. Okay. Um, you mentioned earlier uh, commercial radio thriving and obviously online and all this stuff. Are there any um, programmes or stations that you're a bit jealous of? Jealous of? Yeah. I mean, LBC's doing very well. LBC's doing, doing very what well. What about it's Times well. Radio, nicking all the, nicking all the uh, Radio 4 presenters? Are you not annoyed? Uh, no, we genuinely like competition. Um, if you only have one track for your career, uh, and it's only the BBC that is actually restrictive. It means you don't get the best people coming into the, the sector and it gives people not enough choice in terms of their career. And frankly, competition is good. You know, we've always been believed, we've never wanted, apart from the 1922 phase, a, a kind of just the BBC in the market. Having competition is Darwinian, creates new ideas and gets to, to best services. Uh, I, I guess the, the thing that they've been able to do that we haven't been able to do is to launch dozens and dozens of extensions on on DAB um so you know absolute 80s mm. 90s you know that is something that we we thought about doing ourselves but actually in lockdown we decided not to um but actually the thing that we can do most effectively is to uh, in terms of DAB the thing we can do most effectively is to innovate within sounds and I think what you know what we've got had in the last few years in radio is We've put linear radio online, we've done podcasts, but there's a huge opportunity in the middle in terms of how we can create true digital radio, uh, how we can suit your radio for to you, to what you like, and to what we think you should be finding out about, about trying to serve specialist music genres like, like jazz or um, the kind of music that Elizabeth Orca plays uh, on Unclassified. Can we provide the kind of scheduled lean back experience that radio provides but with the benefits of relevance and personalization that you can get from digital services. So, so I think you know, we admire what they've done with the AB extensions. Uh, it's not something that we're going to pursue for now, but what we are going to do is really try and innovate what true digital radio can be within sounds. And a bit like we did that with iPlayer, and that then grew a whole new use case and a whole new sector of the market, maybe we can do that with radio and, and provide a continuation of the radio habit for young people. I, I think one of the things that we see from our research is when young people aren't using radio, it's because they sometimes don't think it's relevant enough for them. If yeah. we can find a way of making it more relevant, can we 
make sure that in 10 or 20 years time, linear radio is just as um, healthy as it is as it is today. Okay. Um, uh, there's a, 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 something I wanted to ask you about you uh, really quickly, which was an announcement that was made um, just a couple of days ago um, about diversity, which was um, uh, around radio. It was a BBC radio music and it was um, um, announced that you're committing £12 million of existing commissioning budget to diverse and inclusive content. So how are you going to measure this? What is your definition of success? And um, given that it's kind of existing commissioning budget, how will you shifting away from things? Is it just the same? Um, are you just committing the same things, but making sure you have uh, diverse makers or what, what's going to happen? It's both. So this is something that we've been doing um, across the BBC. So our TV colleagues have done it uh, as well. And uh, uh, imitation being the sincerest form of flattery, you basically took their framework and trying to do the same in radio. And we do know from Ofcom's uh, research that radio is less diverse than TV and we've got, we've got further to go than TV. Um, but, so we announced quite a wide range of initiatives, but this particular one is about trying to act on the demand side and making clear to people from diverse backgrounds that there is appetite and money for their, for their stories. So it's about reserving 12 million pounds, as you said, uh, and we want to try and avoid kind of stupid commissioning by, by numbers or box ticking. So we're keeping it at quite a high level in terms of the framework, but it's basically cr diverse creative teams, diverse owners of an indie or production teams in our, in our, in our case, or diverse stories, but it doesn't have to be diverse stories. You know, we, we, we heard very much in consulting about this that um, uh, people from diverse backgrounds don't want to be boxed into only talking about their experience. So mm -hmm. that's one way in which that could be met, but not the only one. And, and I suppose we're saying with, with, this focuses on uh, people um, uh, who are BAME, who are disabled or uh, working class. And people sometimes say, well, why those characteristics? And that's where the BBC feels, where we feel we've got furthest to go, where we've got the biggest, the biggest deficit. Okay. But I do have a few questions here that I feel like I should um, ask because I haven't asked all of them. And um, there's a couple which return back to education. Um, one of them here is, um, uh, are there plans for the BBC to link up more closely with educational establishments? I'm not quite sure what establishments means. Um, are there? So I think that may be getting to a debate which is starting um, about whether there should be an open school. Uh, so like open Nuts, university, so open school. Practice. So Bob yeah. Moon, who's a professor emeritus at the OU, and Tim Brookhouse, who used to um, uh, be a leading educationalist, um, uh, have floated this question about whether there should be an open school like there is an open university. Uh, and we want to be part of that debate. It's clearly not for us to decide what, what whether that should happen. But I think one thing we can do now that we've seen that we can provide this service into classrooms and for parents, can we try and provide kind of the spine of that content so that when kids turn on their computer uh, or their mobile phone or their iPad, that you can have a guaranteed of high class education for all of the curricula, for all of the exam boards, for every year of the, uh, and a bit like the BBC provides a spine, but there's then space for commercial competition, try and get the best, best out of both worlds. So, so we're, we're keen to do that. We definitely don't want to replace the role of schools. You know, schools are the people who are best placed to deal with pupils. We would just like to provide the, the content to make sure that we can get the best of both, both these worlds. Okay, and there's another one that's slightly, um, uh, just a, at a tangent to that, which is um, how has uh, COVID generally and the youth of, uh, of the BBC as, an edu as, 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 as education, how is it affected with the relationship with the BBC and Open University? Because obviously that's a kind of, it's a separate thing. Um, I think there's been less focus uh, there because the crisis was really much, very much at, um, uh, uh, at the school level. We continue to work really effectively with the, with the OU. I think one area of interest is whether this um, experience of blended learning is something that will be valuable for adults as well. You know, I think that is an area which was already growing quite a lot um, uh, of, of its own bat. I think we can do more of that. But um, I think for us, the big focus has been on, on, on children in primary and secondary age. Uh, okay. 
Um, I've got another couple of questions. One is a reaction to when we were talking about the diversity commitment. Um, it's noted uh, by this attendee that the uh, BBC executive committee is overwhelmingly white. What steps could there be made to fix this? Would you step down, for example, to rectify this? Um, I don't think getting people to step down is the best way of achieving that. I think the right way of achieving it is to um, have proper succession plans and proper targets. So the BBC... But, there, but succession plans can take a while. I mean, I remember having a conversation, and this is not around um, uh, executive committees, this was around the, uh, the presenters on Radio 2, that they, it was all male and it was all white in weekday daytime from like half six in the morning till seven at night. And, the, you know, you have to make moves. Do you have to sometimes move people out? And in radio, we've done that. So in radio, mm. our 15% target for uh, BAME managers. Um, we've got further to go in terms, of, um, uh, in terms of getting our workforce up to that target. But we've met all of our other targets in terms of being representative in terms of disability, in terms of um, uh, people who are lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, non-binary. So actually, uh, you're right, we have to act. We, we have succeeded in doing that. So we now have over 50% of our uh, leaders in radio and music are uh, uh, from an ethnic minority background. Uh, and they are in positions of power as well. So, and, and actually, we see that in our content. You know, when, uh, when we have the George Floyd uh, uh, death, I kind of followed that as a, as a news story. And mm. I simply hadn't understood until... Lorna Clark texted me that this was something which was affecting people viscerally and primarily. They were feeling it themselves. And it was because uh, those parts of uh, BBC Radio are naturally diverse, that they got to that issue fast and that they created amazing content in the next week. So there's the, the, I, I do think the picture is very different to one that it would have been five or ten years ago. To your point about schedules, we're going we're gonna to monitor that as well. We're going to uh, find a way of calculating how we're doing on that. And then we are also going to make sure that we have representative um, uh, schedules. So if we, we look to- I mean, I mean if we, to, the, to the example that you just mentioned, mentioned, you know, Radio 2 is obviously very different today than mm. to that. To that so if we looked at the BBC Executive Committee in a year's time, it might be very different? Well, that's for Tim Daly to decide rather than me, but, but it's not true to say that the Executive Committee is all, uh, is all white and uh, it's kind of slightly invidious to start picking people out, but mm. you know, uh, to uh, BME people on, on that exec. Uh, every single board on the BBC uh, is having uh, two advisors uh, who are uh, normally from a BME uh, background. But as I say, in terms of my senior leadership team, we're a very diverse team and that is paying off in terms of um, fantastic creativity. And that's the reason, that's the reason for doing it. Okay, great. We've got another question, um, which is around, um, it's, it's kind of around the future of the, of the BBC. And I'm aware that you are education and radio, but I'm going to ask it you anyway. Oh, yeah. um, so, <laughs> it says that some quite distinguished writers have suggested that Netflix, for example, will pull out of drama co-productions with the BBC to retain full value of um, IP. What's, what would be your strategy for dealing with this? I mean, this is slightly off your, off your uh, remit, yeah. but. Um, I'm, well, this is something we've been dealing for, for, for a while now. And, uh, you know, we work with Netflix well on some co-productions. You know, clearly they have gone through a period of wanting to have more exclusivity, uh, and that's something that we work with them uh, uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Other streamers have been very keen to co-produce, very keen to buy archives. So as more competitors have come into the market, that's been a real benefit for uh, for us and for studios. I think the biggest thing that we've done is change our availability pattern. Uh, so you know, in radio, we're lucky that we've got. Um, uh, long availability of our content, particularly our, uh, our speech content. In TV, they didn't have that. They had 30 days uh, maximum. That's why we were so keen to get up to a year and to have more uh, exclusivity of our content on our own platform. So I think in TV, what you're gradually seeing is people having more control and exclusivity of their content. Netflix are doing that. We're doing that. Um, but there's sometimes when you can share the content, and that can work for both, for both, for both sides as well. Okay, I've got um, another question here, which is, um, do you have any advice for young people who are trying to break into radio in particular? Sometimes people ask me about journalism and I think, oh goodness, why would you bother? And sometimes people, perhaps people feel like that about radio. Why would they bother breaking into radio when they could just go straight into podcasts? <laughs> um, 
So I think the best advice is make stuff. And there's huge opportunities to do that now. You know, 20, 30 years ago, it would have been about getting a job in student radio, or local radio. And those routes are still very good. There's still lots of people come through from that. But people can now just make their content. You know, they can go and work for an online radio station. Uh, they can make podcasts. They can make programs. And actually, that is something which is hugely beneficial in terms of diversity as well. You know, we've seen that our traditional recruitment processes were not producing the diverse outcomes that we, uh, that we wanted. Uh, and actually getting people to provide work is a brilliant way of being able to overcome some of those, um, uh, some of those things which militate against fair recruitment. Uh, don't give up, I think is a key, key thing. You know, any highly sought after profession does kind of make it difficult for people to, to get in. And one of the tests is, are you persistent? Again, some of those things in the past were biased against inclusivity, you know, like people being asked to work for free. We've got rid of all of, all of that as well. Um, so uh, I suppose the biggest thing I would say is B the BBC is a great place to work. and We are welcoming, genuinely welcoming of a whole range of different talents. We're going to build a really inclusive culture. So I'd encourage people to come and come and work with us. OK, um, I have two more questions. Um, one is um, about uh, local radio uh, from Duncan Thomas. BBC local radio is highly prized by a section of your audience, but has been reduced in recent years because of budget pressures. Um, does this come under you? If not, should it? And how can you support it? It doesn't come under me. I don't think it uh, uh, should come under me. Um, it works extremely well as part of um, uh, Ken uh, McQuarrie's uh, division. Um, and the reason for that is the, is the locality of it. You know, you want people who are working on the, uh, on the news, local news programme, regional news programme, to be working with in the same building as people who are working on the, uh, on the radio station. Um, all that's happening with local radio is they're getting through the same process of uh, cuts as the rest of the BBC. They, they've actually been um, uh, cut a little bit less than, uh, than, than network radio. But it has been a complicated thing to do because it is a, you know, dozens and dozens of stations, hundreds of people, a very, very complicated um, process, and we've taken our time to, uh, to get it right, and we make no apology for that. But it's not about not caring about local radio, it's just about making sure that everybody at the BBC contributes to that £800 million target, but they are absolutely vital, and indeed, you kind of look at what they've done in, uh, in lockdown, local radio, through their Make a Difference initiatives, had a million people contact them, asking them for help. So I think that shows the the sort of ongoing value of local radio. Yeah, very much so. Makes some great podcasts as well. Okay, um, this is uh, uh, just a general question. What do you listen to for pleasure rather than work? Be um, honest. Obviously, I love all of my children. Uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, and I do, I do. I love our radio networks. I think they're one of the great joys of living in this. Uh, You've got to answer this question. Come on. Things I really, um, uh, the kind of absolute part of my weekly routine so unclassified uh, on thursday evening uh on radio three i could kind of download and listen to on repeat um i always look forward to giles giles's show on a saturday saturday afternoon giles peterson yeah um yeah. during lockdown that was my uh, my running soundtrack until i went over on my own call listening to uh, uh the uh, desert island discs uh, lockdown lockdown special uh, I'm a huge fan of uh, Radio 4 Factual, um, uh, so I suppose the, the long view last week, I don't know if you heard that, but the one on race going back to 1968 and what that meant yeah. for the election and the, the silent majority. Um, I'm big, I've used, listened to a lot of podcasts as well, so a huge number of podcasts uh, from us and then lots of podcasts from a whole range of other people. Do you want me to name some podcasts? Yes. <laughs> yeah, uh, at the moment, I am really loving, uh, so this has to be other people, does it? Um, uh, Bow Down, which is a podcast from Freeze about um, women artists, uh, yeah. where you get someone interviewing, being interviewed about a particular favourite of theirs. I've been uh, chugging through those very happily. Um, uh, the Slate Political Gab Fest, I love about American, American politics. Actually, that's something which we really took a lot of inspiration from in terms of, I remember... Andy Bowers, who produced that the first time, saying the best advice he ever gave that team was have the conversation you'd have in the bar after recording the program rather than yeah. the radio program. Get yourself. So that's both something I love, but also something which has been very helpful for us in terms of making uh, in terms of making podcasts. And then, well, things like Brexit cast and uh, those kind of 
Thanks. If I'm allowed some BBC One's uh, newscast uh, in our time, the Louis Theroux podcast we have at the, at mm. the moment, Ellis and James on, on Five Live. Excellent podcast. Yeah, a lot. I, okay. I, I, I could go on. Okay, fine. Um, well, I'd like to say um, uh, uh, thank you very much. We are coming to the end of our time. There are other questions um, that I haven't got to, and I do apologise about that. Um, but such is the, the nature of a conversation. This is a conversation rather than a full on hardcore interview. Um, so thank you very much, uh, James, for joining us. Thank you for joining us, um, audience. Now it's time to go and get a lovely sandwich, wherever you are, I imagine. And um, we just have to wave and say goodbye. Thank you, audience. Thank you, Miranda. No, thank you.